All right, so this morning we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to pick up where Paul is continuing to write to the Corinthians. And today I want us to kind of look at something. This is what kept occurring to me as I was reading this chapter and doing my Bible study was there's a lot of turnings in this chapter, and you'll see what I mean as we get, get to it. First of all, the Corinthians had allowed some people to come in, some false teachers, and cause a lot of divisions and problems within their midst, didn't they? And they had actually turned the people, some of the people, against Paul. Here, Paul, who had come and given them the gospel, who had been faithful to them, and yet, what did he do? Uh, what did they do? They, they turned against him. And, and how hard that must have been on him. Well, Paul is now saying, okay, I've heard the good news that you have received my letter. He sent a letter to them saying, you stupid people. No. He <laughs> said, <laughs> I knew you'd pay attention to that. <laughs> that's probably what he wanted to say. That's probably what we would have said. But, you know, basically he, he said he was very straight with them and he, he felt bad about it in one way that he had to be so straight with them. Have you ever had to do that with somebody? Just, you just felt your heart like, oh, Lord, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. But God's like, no, they need to hear this. And so that's kind of what happened with Paul. He would sent him a letter. And he, ever since he had written it and sent it off, and he didn't have email. He didn't have text. So it didn't go instantly. He had to wait for somebody to take that letter, walking, you know, to take. He, he was worried about it the whole time, how they were going to receive it. And in this chapter, we see that he finds out from Titus that, oh, thanks be to God, they received it as I wanted it to be, as love, that I was trying to teach them that, you know, they're being led astray and this is going to hurt them and, and that he loved them and he was trying to bring them back to the Lord. So, so as we read this, we're going to see that just like then, now things come into our lives and even into our church and they try to infiltrate our hearts, and they're not right. And we have to know the word, and we have to know the Lord, and he'll then show us that's not right. So many things we see in the world, and we hear TV and things you read and people talking about stuff. I mean, it's just constantly bombarding your mind. Sometimes my mind, when I go to bed, it's kind of like, oh, I'm just tired of all that. It's just so much, you know, and, and I just need to cut out more and more of that and just so that I can... Just have that peace of the Lord. I don't know if it's just because I'm getting older. Is it just because I'm getting older? Is that the people has? Okay, I didn't know. I was like, either the world's really getting worse, or I'm just getting older and I can't take it anymore, or maybe it's both. I don't know, but it's not good. So anyway, there are five different times that I want us to look at where a turning <laughs> occurs. And the first one we're going to look at is in verse 1 where it starts out as, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And this is the first time where he says, turn or leave, cleanse yourself from all that filthiness. And he, he was kind of talking to them in the sense that, look, you've let these false teachers come in. You've let a lot of stuff happen in the church that shouldn't have happened. Cleanse yourself from that stuff. But he says, because we have these promises, we should do these things. And the promises he's talking about is from back in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, where he said, uh, God had said, and Paul was telling them, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So he gave these amazing promises that he would be our God. And not just that, but he would be our father, and we would be his daughters. Wow. I just want to ask you, does that motivate you? Does that thought motivate you to want to grow closer to the Lord and to cleanse your heart of those things? Sure does. Okay, so Paul's saying, turn away from the filthiness, uh, cleanse yourself or turn away from the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Well, there's two different kinds of cleansings that, that can happen. The first cleansing is when we come to the Lord. We come to him, we recognize our sin, and we say, Lord, <laughs> here I am with all this garbage and this mess, and I need you so much forgive me, be my Lord. And at that moment, then he cleanses us 
John, uh, 1 John 1, 9 tells us very clearly, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that first kind of cleansing is something that we don't have a part in. We don't do it. We don't work towards it. We don't make it happen. There's nothing. We just come and say, oh, here's my stuff. I need you so much. And he does the work. The second kind of cleansing, though, is the one that Paul's talking about here. He says, cleanse yourselves. And you're like, wow, can I do that? <laughs> I don't know. Does that work? Well, what it is is that he's saying that in cooperation with the Lord, he wants you to grow in him and to, you have a choice, you know, you have a free will all the time to choose good or to choose evil. And so he's saying, turn from evil and turn to what is good. So uh, it is a participation of our will and our effort along with God working in us and the Holy Spirit working in us. Now, there's two things he says we should cleanse ourselves from. The first one is filthiness of the flesh. And I think that's the one I always think about when I think about being pure before God. Like, I want to be pure before God. So how am I pure before God? Well, if I don't watch things I shouldn't watch, I turn them off if I see something I, I think is good for us or you know, losing my temper or being rude or selfish or l stealing, lying, cheating. Those are the kind of things I think of that's sins of the flesh. But then he also says you need to cleanse yourself from the filthiness, he calls it filthiness, ugh, of the spirit. And this is the one that is, I think for all of us, the harder one because it's so deep down inside of us, these things like pride, legalism, self-focus, self-righteousness, bitterness, ooh, that's a hard one, hatred, all of those things inside of us, they just tend to grow and have ten tendrils or tentacles or things that just grow down inside of us. And like we have to rip them out. That's the only way we can get them out of us. So those are hard. And I think sometimes we, we, we work on the obvious ones. We work on the sins of the flesh first. Like, oh, I'm stopping that. I'm not doing that anymore, you know. Uh, but part of that might be, it occurs to me, because people can see those things. Like, well, people know if I did that, you know, or if I, if I drank this, I got drunk that night, or I smoke, or whatever. They're going to see all these things, or if I, you know, if I do these things, if I steal, or whatever. So those things that are seen, it's kind of easier to go, okay, I'm getting rid of that. I, you know, I'm a child of God now. I don't do those kind of things. But when it comes to the sins of the Spirit, we think maybe we can get away with just a little bit of it. That we can, it's okay. We have just a little bit of this. It's all right. It, we, we can get away with it, right? But the sad thing is that that statement says that we care more about what people think than what God thinks. And we know that that is, that is immature. And it also is keeping us in that kind of attitude and holding on to something keeps us from the wonderful blessings that God wants to grow us in. Maturity, Christian maturity is marked by what you do when only God sees. When only God sees it, that tells what's really, you want to take a test? You want to see how spiritually mature you are? The next time somebody treats you badly or does something mean to you or doesn't give you your due attention or whatever it might be and you feel that like <laughs> rising up in you, what are you saying? What is your heart saying at that moment? And, and what do you do about it? You know, like, uh, well, they didn't, you know, they didn't treat me very nice, and I did this, and I made that food for them, and they didn't even say they liked it, you know, and boy, how can that always happen to me? I, my food is not that bad. I don't, you know, I'm just saying this because I did make a cake for somebody, and they didn't say anything about it, and they sat there and <laughs> ate it. <laughs> Three people, and they're like eating it, and they're my family, you know, but they're eating it, and I'm thinking, I wonder if they like it. I can't even eat it because I'm not allowed to eat that, so I made the cake, and I'm looking at it going, I really like to have it, and they're just <laughs> eating it, and they're like, I wonder if they liked it. I don't know. <laughs> but you know what? If you just stop yourself right there and say, okay, look, all right. Do I deserve anything? Really, I deserve death and hell. And that's, These things are so unimportant, Lord. Help me not to focus on that, but to focus on you. So that's one of those turnings. I'm just turning away from that. I'm just going to focus on you. Um, okay, so Paul continues to talk about this, the turning, and he's saying, now at first he said, turn from the sins of the flesh and the spirit, but he says, perfect holiness in the fear of God. That's the filling. You're turning to God. You're focusing on him. He's going to fill you. Now, 
That doesn't mean, we hear that, perfecting holiness and the fear of God, and you're like, perfecting? Perfection? Me? I don't, how is that ever going to happen? Well, just trust me, it's never going to happen in the way that we're thinking, which is that I am sinless and all perfect. Never. But there is a sense that perfection can mean wholeness or completeness. And so what I like to look at it is, and that's what kept coming in my mind, is like, that's the enemy. I'm glad nobody's sitting over there. And this is, <laughs> and this is God. And I'm not just doing this or that, but I'm just like this. I'm all about this. I'm not going anywhere else. I'm only facing the Lord. So that's what I'm thinking, holiness, complete, completeness or holiness. I am holy turning towards the Lord. That's what I think we can think of it in that way. Okay, so I want to read Colossians 3 because it's just a very well-known chapter that talks about putting off and putting on, and it really helps us to understand it's not just enough to empty ourselves of the bad stuff, but we need to be filled with the Lord. So it says in, in Colossians 3, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So there again, we see that those things grow in us, that wholeness, that whole holiness in us. But that growth is totally dependent on your cooperation and my cooperation. You know, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. The Lord will never force you but he will show you, he will draw you, he will teach you. And whenever you say, okay, I'm going to cooperate on this point, I'm going to give that thing up, I'm going to stop saying that in my mind, I'm going to stop holding that against him. You know what it is. We've got all these things, right? I mean, is there a part of you that you're holding back from the Lord? Is there something that maybe even you hide? maybe a secret sin or maybe an attitude about something that's happened to you and you feel justified to have that attitude and yet it's not pleasing to the Lord? You know, repentance is what this is about. Repentance is making an about face. You know, in the army, how they do their feet and then they turn around. I would just be falling down because I would be tripping up on my feet, but they just turn completely around the opposite direction. Or I like Pastor Ted says this, that repentance is agreeing with God. I agree with you, Lord, that these things are right, and I want to walk in that way, right? So that's what he wants us to do is to completely turn from those things. And we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of the Gospels, that it says we are to love the Lord God with all of our hearts, soul, and mind. And you think, well, I love God. I love God, sure. Sure but I just can't give this little thing up, you know? But this is what the Bible says about that in John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, Jesus says, he will keep my word. So we say, oh, I love you, Lord, but I just, I can't stop this. I just, I I can't give up that anger that I have about that person. You know what they did to me, Lord? And it's like the Lord saying, do you love that, your feeling, your justification and doing your vindication or whatever, more than me? Because that's what you're doing. You're making an idol. It's more important. So we say we love God, but we really have to put it into action. And that's what he's saying. With the help of the Holy Spirit, he wants to work in us, and he's waiting for us to give up those things. Do you remember what happened to Lot's wife when she looked back? (laughs) salt she turned into a pillar of salt right it's like I don't know what she was looking back at but I would assume it wasn't just to see the flames like you know you're thinking like you'd want you hear something blowing up behind you or whatever you're like what is that you know Um, as a matter of fact poor Janet was telling me where are Janet there but that she was skiing and when she told me this story, I'm like, this is so like my lesson. And, you know, I know the Lord knows that. But she's skiing, and a child got in front of her. And so she had to swerve to try to avoid them. And then as she's looking back to make sure they're okay, 
she runs into a, a tree, basically, and try, you know, trying to avoid that and gets into this accident. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, how sweet of you to turn and look back. <laughs> but there are times when looking back just is not a good idea. You know? <laughs> and obviously with that, it was probably not a good idea, but you, know, you did it out of the goodness of your heart. But Lot's wife turned back, I believe, because there were things in Sodom and Gomorrah that she was going to miss. And how sad was that? Because it was a horrible, filthy place. Also, we look in Luke 9, 62, and Jesus had said when he was teaching the cost of discipleship, and he said, no one having put their hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, looking back is not just looking back at your old sins. My old life was like this or whatever, but it's also saying, I want some sin to stay here with me. I'm not going to wholly turn aside from that. I'm going to just keep a little eye out on this one. That's also that looking back, not saying, I'm willing to give everything to you, Lord, all of me. Have you ever seen a movie where there's like, um, I watch I watch TV sometimes, I watch a really stupid movies. My husband's like, <laughs> mostly Hallmark, you know, but I, at least they're clean. They're clean, you know? So, but sometimes I, I love like science fiction or things like that sometimes, and I'll be watching something where, the bad guy is coming and he's chasing this young girl, you know, and she's like, ah, and so she's running and she keeps looking back to see, is he getting closer? And I'm like, stop looking back and just run. What are you doing? You know what I mean? And she'll like, stop and look again. I'm like, oh, how stupid is that? And, and then not only that, but they always make her fall down. Why do women always fall? Maybe because they're looking back. Oh, okay. So stop looking back. Be totally focused on the Lord. Okay, if we look in a certain direction, that's the direction we're going to go. So if we're focused on the Lord, we're going to grow in that. What about Joshua? What if he had looked back when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him? What if he had needed just a look at what he was missing? Oh, what that would have done in his heart. What a difference that would have made in that story. But instead, he ran from her and he ran to the Lord. And every time in his life, we saw that as people would do things to him or th bad things would happen to him that weren't his fault. He was trying to be right, that he would go to God. He would trust God in those things. I love that about him. So which way we turn determines what we're going to focus on. And like Gina gave us that teaching last week, which was so precious about, I only have eyes for you, Lord, you know, how we look at the Savior. He's our focus, and that just helps us to see him to remember him, to, to keep our eyes on him. So we have to keep our eyes on the prize, and that's Jesus. You know, Paul likened our walk to a race, and he said, to, for the goal set before us. Well, that goal set before us is Christ. It's not what Christ can do for me along the way as I get there. It's him. It's just him. You know, I have found this week, especially just um, hurting a lot, I had a lot of pain this week, that my faith in God is, it reminded me, it's not because God will heal me, or God will, you know, do this, or he'll do that, no, simply because he is God. I, I'm like, wow, I needed to just see that again, I needed to know that again, we need to know that. Because when things get hard in our life, we think, why are you letting this happen to me? And we question God's love. This world was never promised to be easy, right? In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But if you keep your eyes on the Lord, he can bring you through everything. He can even give you joy. Remember when Paul was saying, uh, actually, it's in the next verses that we're going to get to, uh, 4 through 6. He says, great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. I mean, I don't usually call my friend or text my friend and say, boy, I'm really happy in this trial. You know, like, this is, a, this is a good one. I really like it, you know. No, but there still is joy no matter what we're going through because I'm not alone. He's with me. He's right there with me. So this is the third turning, and that is when the Corinthians repented. When they turned from their sin, that was the turning that then caused Paul to have such great joy. 
You know, Paul, I just want to talk about this a little bit, and that is that Paul cared about those people so much that he could not be at peace, really, in his spirit. There was still something in him that worried and for them, for their souls. He couldn't be at peace until he received that news from Titus that they had received that word of rebuke, of correction, and they had turned their hearts back to the Lord. Then that's when that joy came to his heart. But, but until then, he couldn't really, couldn't really feel comfortable. He was so concerned about them. And I wonder if we understand the burden that our pastors and leaders feel for us. I wonder if we understand that they have given their lives to minister to us, to serve us. You know, it'd be a lot easier for them not to do that, to just go out and get a job and do something else. And I'm telling you this from experience because I was a pastor's wife for 20 years. And there were many times that myself or other ministers' wives would be like, you know, we just want to quit. We just want to quit and go get a job and live like normal people and not have everybody just picking on us and, you know, looking at us in a fishbowl and, you know, feeling like we're never good enough. We're trying to give everything we have and they're not appreciated. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with the ministry that unless you're really involved in it, you don't realize. You know, I see Brenda and I talk to her and I think, oh, you know, she's doing good. I have no idea. And sometimes I will hear, you know, later of, there was this, there was a death, there was this, there was this. And they were all dealing with that until late last night. I had no idea of all of that. But I'm just saying all this to say, we need to pray for them. We need to appreciate them. No, they're not perfect, but they have a call from the Lord to, to shepherd us, to lead us, to protect us. And so we need to be up, holding up their arms in prayer to, to, to appreciate them and let them know that you're thankful. You know, it must have hurt Paul so much, not so much that the church had some problems, but that those people were convinced to turn against him, you know? And I think we need to be careful in what we say about our ministers. You know, too easily we can criticize, oh, we're so good at it. I mean, you just see, well, why didn't they do that? Why didn't they do this? I mean, hello, who made you judge and jury, you know? Come on, we do that. I do it, and then I catch myself like, wait a minute, you know, they're doing the best they can. You know, if, yeah, if somebody's going against the word of God, then of course we have to say, you know, let me talk to you, brother or sister. I mean, this is, this is not right. But sometimes we just get so critical. And I just want to say, let's just be careful about what we say and let's pray for them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, well, I'm not finished with that tirade. I just also wanted to say <laughs> that when we are corrected, by them or asked to do something that, you know, maybe it's a little hard for us or whatever. We feel defensive about something they've said. Could you just lay that down at Jesus' feet and say, Lord, I, I just trust you with that. I just trust you. They have a burden that they want to care for me. Help me to help them carry that burden. You know how the Paul had that great joy and comfort when the people came back to the Lord and they, they loved Paul again. They saw that Paul's heart was for them. That's the kind of joy and comfort you can bring to your pastors and leaders when you obey the Lord, when you are in there digging, wanting to receive. I feel bad for Pastor Ted sometimes because, you know, sometimes we come in and there's actually a scripture that says, you know, don't pay any attention to their faces because what we don't realize is when we're sitting there, signs we're like, <laughs> we're not bored maybe, but we're just relaxed. <laughs> and sometimes I think, oh, you know, if we just had mirrors to see our faces, it's funny, but... You know, Pastor, Pastor Ted is so great. He just keeps giving us the word, and we, we are receiving it. But sometimes our faces don't look so much like that, you know, which makes me think of the next turning, which is turning number four, and that is turning sorrow to joy. Sometimes we're downcast, you know. Our faces are they're down. <laughs> that's why I call it downcast, I guess, because you're looking down or something. But that's when, at that moment, we can look up can look up to the Lord, you know, we can turn to him and he will comfort us. Um, he's like, it's like we're a child. We need to be a child when we come to the Lord, you know, not in our intellect, not in our knowledge and our wisdom, but, you know, in the Lord saying, I'm just, I'm just, I need help here, Lord. I'm so weak in this area. I, I keep failing over and over in that thing. And every time I just say, I'm not going to do it. And just come to him as a child, and he comforts us, he strengthens us. Um, and we know that Matthew 6.33 says, 
but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Just another way of saying, focus totally on him. He's going to take care. He'll take care of everything that goes on around you. I was thinking about a friend of mine. She had twin girls, unbeknownst to her. She looked pretty big, but she was a short girl. So, you know, you just thought, well, she has a big baby. Well, she didn't know she had twins. So they went in, delivered the first one, and then the doctor said, oh, you have another one here. And the, the husband was like, that is really not funny, doctor. And he's like, I'm really not kidding. So <laughs> sure enough, two girls come out, you know. Well, about when they were about three, we went to Knott's Berry Farm together. We were out, and I had my two kids, and she had her two little girls. And somehow, in us being out, one of the girls got away from us. Uh, I don't know how that happened, because, you know, you're always so careful with your kids at places like that. And as soon as we realized, where's Stella? I mean, we were all just panicking, you know. But I was thinking of her, that little girl, when she realized, you know how they do, they'll toddle around for a while, and then all of a sudden they're like, Where's my mom? Wait a minute, you know, this isn't fun anymore. Where's my mom, you know? But that, that, that lost feeling inside of them. And then when they see their mom or their daddy, and it's just like, oh, you know, come, come to me. Well, that's kind of the way it is. When we recognize, okay, he's right here with me. He's right here with me. God is with me. So, yeah, I might feel lost. I might be having a hard time. But he's with me, so I can focus on that, and then whew, that makes everything okay. I can run into daddy's arms you know, and be okay. Okay, our final turning, number five, is that godly sorrow turns us to repentance. Godly sorrow, it says uh, in verses 9 and 10, it says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So we can be sorry, we can be sorrowful, we can be sad, but what we do about that makes the difference. If we turn it over to the Lord and we let him bring <coughs> us through that, it brings repentance, it brings healing, it brings joy, it brings clean, a cleanliness from that, that thing that happened. But if all we do is sorrow in it, that leads to death. I have a couple of uh, quotations from Redpath, which were so good that I'm, I apologize for reading them, but they're so good. You know, sometimes people have just a way of putting things into, into words that are so great. It says, how sorry do you think you have to be? What is the purpose for sorrow for sin? It is to bring you to trust in the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not your sorrow that cleanses you from sin, but his blood. It's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. Has your sorrow for sin led you at one time or another to fling all the burden of it at the feet of a crucified, risen Savior? If it hasn't, anything short of that is what Paul calls sorrow that leads to death. I just thought, what a beautiful picture of us just coming to his feet and just laying it all out there. And then he says, godly sorrow that leads to repentance, therefore, is a sorrow that leads to a change of purpose, of intention, and of action. It's not the sorrow of idle tears. Been there. It is not crying by your bedside because once again you have failed. Nor is it vain regret, wishing things had never happened, wishing you could live those moments over again. No, it is not that. It is a change of purpose and intention and a change of direction and action. When you allow God to take that sorrow from that thing, he will help you to be determined not to go there again, to wholly focus on him. And I'm just going to quickly go through the things, and you'll talk about it, I'm sure, in your Bible study. These are the things that you know when these things start appearing, you know you have true repentance. Otherwise, you might just be feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> I've been there too. Yes. So the good thing is, this is what it produces. When we truly repent and turn from that thing, it says it, it produces diligence, which is just the, that, that strength to keep going day by day to do what is right. It clears you of yourself. I like that. I'm so full of myself sometimes. I don't even realize it. And then God comes in and just, oh, when I repent of myself, of filling myself with myself, then he, he fills me up with him and I can focus on him. 
It says, what indignation and fear. I thought that was funny, but it's like we are indignant at ourselves for our foolishness in sin and fear when we realize how easily we're led astray, not wanting to repeat that. And then what vehement desire or a great desire for purity and godliness and not to sin anymore. And that comes when we want to pray. We want, oh God, I want to hear your voice. I want to fill your spirit with me. And what zeal, um, the Greek word for that means like uh, heat. So we're passionate towards God and hot against sin and impurity. We don't want that anymore. We saw what that did to us. We know what the result of that is. We don't want that anymore. And then what vindication. I recognize and accept the price that's paid for my sin. I like this little quote, and I don't know who said it, but it said, the measure of a Christian is not whether or not they sin, but whether or not they repent. And I just think, do we repent very much anymore? Sometimes not as much as we should. And maybe we repent about little things that are unimportant, but I think we should focus on those things that are of the Spirit. Where does that stuff come from? So when you get into those places and something happens, Lord, what's that about? Why am I so mad about that thing? God will show you. He will show you. He shows us, doesn't he? And then it hurts. It hurts. But hey, better, like I said before, get to the end of yourself. Just realize you ain't got it. God has it. He'll show you, and he'll grow you in that. He'll grow you, and he'll fill you up. He doesn't want you to just be empty and cleansed from sin, but he wants you to be filled with him. That's what gives you the strength to keep walking forward with the Lord, is looking and focusing on him and his love. Amen?